Our scripture reading, our second scripture reading uh, this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 19 to 20. And I'd like to read uh, those short two verses in three different translations, just to give you a little flavor of these two little verses from Paul this morning. First, from the message. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. From the New Living Translation, same two verses. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. And then finally, in the New Revised Standard Version, if for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. This is the word of God for the people of God. Do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? You can, you know, answer that or take it as a rhetorical question. Either way is fine. Do you spend any time thinking about the resurrection of the dead? Be that your own life after your body is laid in the ground or that day that we believe in as Christians. Do you wonder sometimes what will that day be like? How will it happen? What will it look like? Does Jesus' bodily resurrection, what we celebrated on Easter Sunday, last Sunday, have any hope or influence in your day-to-day -day life, in the way that you walk around this world and carry yourself in this world? Why or why not? Does the thought of your own bodily resurrection someday influence the way that you choose to live, the way that you make choices in this day-to-day -day life. Why or why not? I have to confess to you that every Easter for the last decade, probably, I have asked myself these questions, even on Easter Sunday. Is this a day where we like celebrating someone's birthday? We just look backwards to say, on this day, Jesus rose from the dead. Let us mentally and intellectually and theologically remember that that is true. Or does it have some bigger, more long-standing effect on our lives? These are the questions I ponder in this Easter season. Paul uses some interesting phrases here. Jesus is the first fruits among the dead, like the first apple you pick from a tree in the season. The first of the great harvest in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. I love that phrase. Jesus is the first one to be resurrected. We are not. Those who have already died are not the ones to be resurrected first. They are with the Lord, but they do not have resurrected and new and glorious bodies. Those are still to come at the final resurrection when Jesus returns. But when it does, the belief of our Christian faith is that all of us will have new glorious bodies. Not disembodied floating souls as some of our artists have depicted over the years. The human body was and is and will always be good. Physicality was and is and always will be good. Amen? Some of you might know that I love to play this game that the world calls football. At 54 years old, I still chase a round ball around the pitch occasionally and I like to think of my body and my physical glorified body and how much better I will be at soccer in heaven. <laughs> but
But as we know, as each of us know, whether we're five or 90, these bodies, this physicality, this earth that we live in, this life that we live is corruptible, perishable, broken, and weak. I can no longer keep up with my 22-year-old twin boys on the soccer field. I used to be able to do that when they were seven. As Paul says a few verses later in chapter 15 from where we read today, our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. Jesus' body and our future resurrected bodies will be incorruptible, imperishable, strong, glorious, and renewed. 1 Corinthians 15 is Paul's climactic discussion in his letter to the early Christians where he says, we will one day have a transformed physicality and a bodily life after this bodily death, and in fact, all creation will be made new. Not abandoned or obliterated, but made new, glorious, strong, impermeable to death and decay. And in that promise, we eagerly wait and hope for the incorruptible, the imperishable, the strong, the glorious body and life and world to come. We wait for it eagerly. Amen? Hope in the biblical story is not based on human progress or ingenuity. Hope is not a Christian form of optimism. If it is, as Paul says, we are to be pitied among all people. Hope is based upon the one who was born and lived and died and is risen from the dead and has conquered death and opened up a new way of being human, a new way of doing life in this world. And Jesus called it the kingdom of God. Dr. Martin Luther King called it the beloved community. Hope is based on resurrection. Hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus and our resurrection that is to come. A resurrection. Hope is based on the one who was born, lived, and died, and is risen from the dead and has conquered death. A resurrection that says death in all of its tentacles can be, is being and will be eradicated and eliminated and entirely removed from our bodies and our souls and our minds and the very creation itself, our relationships, organizations, households, nations, and families. And we, friends, can begin to experience that reality right now. For we, says Paul in other places, have been risen with Christ. Present tense. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you and me and even more so in the collective us. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, so we too can walk in newness of life. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. God who raised Christ from the dead will give life to our mortal, broken, perishable bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Imagine that Easter morning. Imagine in your mind's eye, Jesus in his body laying on that slab of rock dead. And somehow, mysteriously and mystically, the Holy Spirit breathes new life into Jesus. <gasps> and he receives a new and resurrected body. This is true for us, even in the here and now. So what do we do with the power of the risen Christ that is living within us? Well, I'm glad you asked. Friends, we labor and we work. We labor and we work. 
We co-labor with the risen Jesus in the world, filled with the very spirit, the very breath that filled Jesus' lungs in the tomb on that Easter morning. We co-work with the risen Christ because he is no longer bound by time and space. He is right here with us right now, even though we cannot physically see him. And so we ask for the filling of the Spirit who powerfully and mightily rolled away that stone on Easter morning, defeating death of the grave in that moment, and started a new movement of death-defying, death defying death defeating humans, living, laughing, playing, and working in this world. This, friends, is our work in this world. New Testament scholar Tom Wright says that the early Christians believed so powerfully in the resurrection that they believe God called them to work with Jesus in the power of the Spirit to implement the achievement of Jesus to implement the achievement of Jesus and thereby to anticipate the final resurrection in personal and political life, in mission and in holiness. It was not merely that God had inaugurated the end. If Jesus the Messiah was the end in person, God's future arrived in the present. And those who belong to Jesus and follow him are empowered by his spirit and are charged with transforming the present as far as we are able in light of the future. Let me read that last part again. Those who belong to Jesus and follow him are empowered by his spirit, are charged with transforming the present as far as we are able in light of the future. See, the future is we all have resurrected bodies. The whole creation is made new. And our task now is to implement the future in the present. Are you with me? And this brings in our Hebrew scripture reading from today. The prophet Isaiah who gives us a vision of what this world can look like. Jesus' resurrection and our being raised with Christ in his resurrection is about overthrowing death in all and every forms and manifestations of it in this world. And Isaiah gives us a picture of it. Isaiah says, Former things are forgotten and do not come to mind. Which to me means your past does not shackle you, nor do you hold the past of others against them. People will have joy and health and delight in their eyes. Weeping and crying will be heard no longer. Infants will no longer die at a few days old. In fact, someone who dies at 100 years old will be considered young. Can I get an amen for that? (laughs) People will live as long as trees, says Isaiah. Incorruptible, imperishable bodies. People will not have their houses or jobs taken from them by theft or colonial powers or poverty or gentrification. People will eat the fruit from the plants they planted and are growing. In other words, people will receive a fair wage and a living wage from their labor and work so they can live. Work will be enjoyable. Can I get an amen to that? No longer toilsome and difficult or meaningless. The passing on of generational sin and poverty and misfortune will cease to exist. God will bless people and our relationship with God will be perfectly unified and harmonious. So much so that even before we can speak, God knows what we are saying and what we need. Even the creational tensions of hunters and prey will cease to exist. The lion and the lamb complete and total shalom and harmony. The mountain of God will reign and water will flow down from the mountain of God, trickling into every nook and cranny of our bodies and souls and minds and families and cities and homes and earths and streets and jobs and on and on and on and on. Friends, Jesus rose from the dead for this kind of life to begin flourishing. And while this is ultimately God's work, this is the resurrection vision that is alive in us. It is alive in all of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, ambassadors of Jesus. This is the resurrection vision 
that we labor for and hope for with Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me close with this long reading from Tom Wright. It's not too long, so stay with me. I believe it paints a beautiful picture of what our work is as resurrection people. He says, What you do in the Lord is not in vain. You are not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to roll off a cliff. You are not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be put in a fire. You are not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up for a building site. You are, strange though it may seem, almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself, you are accomplishing something that will become in due course a part of God's new world. Every act of love, gratitude, and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in the beauty of God's creation, every minute you spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care and nurture, of comfort and support for one's fellow human beings and for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures, and of course, every prayer every spirit-led teaching, every deed that spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world. All of this finds its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. That is the logic of the mission of God, God's recreation of God's wonderful world, which began with the resurrection of Jesus and continues mysteriously as God's people live in the risen Christ and in the power of God's Spirit, means that what you do in Christ by the Spirit in this present moment is not wasted. It will lasts all the way into God's new world. In fact, it will be enhanced there. I want you to think for a moment with me this morning how you spend your days. Whether it's in your paid work, your time with friend, friends and family, your hobbies, your volunteer work. Picture in your mind's eye how you spend your days, your weeks. Perhaps particular tasks come to mind, particular faces and places that you go and see. Beloved children of the risen Christ, East Liberty Presbyterian Church family, this Easter season, this next chapter of our life as a church, continue to be steadfast and immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. Amen and amen.